Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is a great honor and a great privilege uh, to be anywhere that's not two degrees and freezing when you're in Chicago and, and it's February. But um, since being here in the Bay, mashallah, I've been meeting with lots of community members, uh, lots of brothers, lots of sisters. And I'm always blown away by the hospitality. I'm always blown away by the friendliness, the amity that I experience from Muslims in the Bay. And this trip has been no different. So I just want to express gratitude for that. I think that it's one of those blessings that you experience continually, but we tend to take it for granted. You know, I remember, funny story about this. I was sitting at Masjid Azhar, and I was talking to this one Egyptian brother who his entire Islamic education consisted of him sitting in Masjid Azhar and just studying in the ruwak of Azhar, those side classrooms of Azhar. And he was an incredibly worldly man because of his you know, exposure to many different people, many different teachers, many different disciplines, many different cultures. So one day I said to him, I said, Wallahi, it's amazing that every group of people excels at something. And I said, look at the Germans, Handasa, engineering. And I said, look at the Japanese, technology. I said, look at the Americans, Sana'at al Asliha, right? Weapons manufacturing. Right? I said, Nahnu kal Muslimin, ma'da natafawwaku fi. I said, as Muslims, what is it that we truly excel in? And he looked at me and he said, Shur shay, drinking tea. La yafuqana fi dhalik ahad. Nobody is better than us at that. And then we laughed a little bit. And then he said, no, no, seriously, diyafa, hospitality. This is, this is one of those one of those kind of, you know, this is a sibgha, a defining characteristic, a stamp of our community that is still very much in uh, 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 existence, still very much being demonstrated until the present day. So jazakumullah khul khair. Um, the topic that I was given to discuss this evening was racism. And to attempt to discuss racism in a single sitting is very ambitious, but this is what the program organizers had in mind, and this is what we will attempt to do, inshallah. And I just have a few seemingly scattered ideas about this that I would like to share, and then we can open the floor and have some conversation, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, in an authentic hadith, in the body there is a lump of flesh. In fasadat, if that lump of flesh is corrupt, fasad al jasadu kullu, the entire body is corrupt. When salahat, salahat al jasadu kullu. But if that lump of flesh is pure, if that lump of flesh is sound, then the entire body is sound. One of the things we can conclude from this beautiful, comprehensive prophetic statement is that every act of beauty that we see from people, every act of dignity, every act of humanity, every act of friendship, every act of, 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 of splendor, dignity, all of those adjectives, they first come from a human heart. Likewise, every act of ugliness, every act of barbarity, every act of unjustifiable violence, every act of harshness, that also emanates from a human heart. And I find that in our context, when we discuss the scourge of racism, as it was titled for tonight's program, we very rarely talk about the spiritual sickness 
that underlies, that undergirds racism. There's abundant talk about racism as a sociological phenomenon. Abundant talk about racism as a historical reality. What I'm curious about as a Muslim, and I think this is what we have to offer to these conversations. It is all too often that Muslims approach issues that are controversial or issues that are um, being discussed popularly. And we think that we have to choose a side. Am I on this side or am I on this side? Whereas I would like to see some tosia. I would like to see us broaden some of these discussions. I would like to see us make some original contributions to some of these discussions. So when we think about racism, there's a lot of um, precedent that we can draw upon from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But nothing occurs as striking to me than the story of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and Iblis, a shaitan. Right? That shaitan, and this is, we know this from the exegetical literature, is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among the angels, but he himself is not an angel. He's one of the jinn. Right? But in the intensity of his worship and in his proximity to the divine presence, he was like one of the angels. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and told shaitan to prostrate, and this is a prostration of ikram, not a prostration of ibadah, the angels prostrated. But shaitan refused to do so. And he said, Ana khairun min, I'm better than him. Many of the Mufassirun, right, contemporary Mufassirun, right, Ibn Ashir, Ibn Ashur, he mentions this was the first instance in creation of somebody arrogating themselves on the basis of their physical constitution, on the basis of how they were created on the basis of something purely arbitrary. This was the first instance of that. In the created order was shaitan's ana khayru min. I'm better than him. And he cites nothing as merit. He didn't say, I'm better than him because I'm more intelligent. I'm better than him because I'm, I'm, I'm more devoted. I'm better than him because I was created from fire and he was created in clean. This is his, you know, justification, his basis for disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a very lively discussion uh, in some of the tafsir literature and in some secondary, I guess you could call them uh, khawatir, kind of spiritual reflections on this encounter. The most striking, in my estimation, is by Ibn Ta'illah in his book, at tanwir Fi Asqat Al-Tadbir. And he is willing to ask, what is animating shaitan's response to Allah Ta'ala commanding him to prostrate? What, what is really underneath the surface? And he says, it's insecurity. That somehow shaitan believed that Adam being promoted or Adam being elevated inherently meant that he was being demoted. Inherently meant that something was being taken from him. That he was losing something in Adam being honored. And then, this is Ibn Ta'ala writing centuries ago. He says, every person that is engaged in some self-serving, other obliterating ideology, they're usually doing so out of insecurity. And insecurity always comes from a mindset 
or a worldview of scarcity, that you believe that what God has is scarce, that if somebody else is esteemed, you are being demoted. If someone else is celebrated, you are being insulted. It's, it's, it's this idea of scarcity, right? It reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where a man entered the masjid and urinated in the masjid, right? And assuming this to be an intentional desecration of the sacred space, some of the sahaba, radiallahu anhum jami'an, they wanted to attack the man. And the Prophet, والسلام, he said, no, no, leave him, leave him. And the man finished urinating. And then the Prophet والسلام, called for a sijlum min al ma. I memorized this hadith, right? Because I've never heard the word sijl used for like a pail. That's, I remember that hadith. Sijlum min al ma. And the Prophet began with his own blessed hand والسلام, to clean this man's urine. This isn't what we're talking about tonight, but I remember as a young boy attending church hearing stories of Christ cleaning the feet of his disciples and how impressed I was with that. And I'm still impressed with that. But here you have the Prophet وسلم, cleaning the urine of his sahaba وسلم, And then he asked the man, مَا حَمَلَ بِكَ أَن تَبُولَ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ what has caused you? Like literally, what carried you? What brought you to the decision to urinate in the mosque? And the man explained that, I didn't think that this would be uh, improper. I didn't think that this would be inappropriate. It was just jahala basita, just simple ignorance. There was no intention to desecrate any sacred space. There was no intention to be an exhibitionist. and No, he just really didn't know. And the Prophet ﷺ explained to him that this is the masjid. And it is to be used for dhikr and qira'ah of the Qur'an and salah. And it is not appropriate that we use it to relieve ourselves. Qadha al haja And seeing this example of prophetic magnanimity that he was wrong and the Prophet ﷺ treated him with great sensitivity and great kindness the man was moved to say oh Allah forgive me and forgive Muhammad for anything he may have done but don't forgive anybody else because he could feel how much they wanted to attack him and the Prophet ﷺ said, Truly, you have made a vast thing constricted. And so people that gravitate toward these self-serving ideologies, they want to limit the favor of God. And they want to exclude some people from enjoying God's you know, one of my teachers said that human dignity is a God-given fiat. It's something that God gives. Allah Ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي Adam." Truly we have ennobled all of the children of Adam. That means that human beings possess an inherent nobility. All of us. And yet there is an insecurity that leads us to try to exclude some from that because in excluding some from that maybe we feel that we're preserving something for ourselves so really in my extrapolation from some of these classical sources and the story of Iblis in the Quran I think that what is really undergirding racism this very uh, pernicious evil is a very deep kind of insecurity, right? Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكْرٌ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَكَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ 
Oh, humanity, we created you from one male and one female. And we spread you intentionally into nations and tribes so that you would come to know one another. Right? In one translation, لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Truly the most ennobled of you in the sight of God are those that possess the most God consciousness. And God is knowing and informed. That's the most common translation of the ayah. That's the translation of the ayah that we see on all of the brochures, in all of the books about the position of Islam vis-a-vis -vis racism. There's another translation of the ayah. I was sitting with a teacher of mine at Azhar. And he said, another way to render this ayah is Right? But the first ta is mahboof. The first ta is omitted. Just like ta'awunu ala birri wa taqwa. It's ta'awunu ala birri wa taqwa. So this is something established in the Quran. So that all of you together will know. In akramakum indallahi atqaqum. We were made into diverse nations, diverse tribes, so that we would know that in most of our virtues, we share them. In most of our mahasin, we share them. Right? There are intelligent people that are black, there are intelligent people that are white. There are moral, well, that's, that's the, actually the end of the ayah. There are inventive people that are black. There are inventive people that are white and other. But what the only substantive differentiation is on the basis of taqwa. And racism, to my mind, is a system that tries to incentivize people to deny the mahasin of some. It's a system that, you know, when I think about um, very practical examples of racism, I think about how if we see someone and we notice that they are in some way experiencing uh, mistreatment. They are in some way experiencing oppression. At least they are complaining of being oppressed. Racism is that desire to say, no, 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 no. It's something inherent to them that leads to them being in this position. It's something, it's not that the system is actually unfair, nor is it that we need to be more introspective. No, no, it's something inherent to them that leads to them being in this position. And the incentivization to make one believe that, no, 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 it's, it's, it's just them. That is kind of the very evil basis of racism. So take for granted, affirmative, like take for example, affirmative action. Right? Take for granted affirmative action. What I find interesting about affirmative action, and when affirmative action is being debated, is that the complexion of the debate is often, well... Should we allow people of color that are actually unqualified to assume positions that white Americans are more qualified for? When if we actually believed in kind of an inherent equality of people, not that all people are equal, but 
that the ratios would be equal. You have some intelligent white people, some intelligent black people, some unintelligent white people, some unintelligent black people. We would be asking, what is it about the way that we are testing? Or what is it about our standards of admission that seems to recognize the intelligence of these people? Seems to validate the intelligence of these people, but does not validate the intelligence of these people does not recognize the intelligence of these people? Or is it that these people are really just more intelligent than these people? See, racism, to my mind, is when we're unwilling to look and say, okay, people have Mahasin, people have intelligence is something, you know, equally distributed among people. Beauty is something equally distributed among people. Being hardworking or work ethic, this is something equally distributed among people. Worth, value, these are things equally distributed among people. So if we are testing in some way for these qualities, then the ratio should probably reflect the ratios of the society. If we believe, and if they don't, then what, what is going wrong? What is happening? Whereas I think racism, when you talk about the inherent denial or dismissal of the dignity of some, is looking at those imbalanced ratios or looking at the imbalanced ratios and say the prison population and saying, hmm, there must be something inherently criminal about African Americans or people of color. There must be something there has to be, because they disproportionately make up the prison population. No, 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 I, I don't believe that. You see, I don't believe that. I'm Muslim. I believe that if we're seeing a disproportionate um, uh, rate of incarceration among African Americans, I don't believe that, it's, that they're inherently more criminal or inherently more prone to criminal activity. I don't believe that. Because to me, that is an affront to a belief that we share in human dignity. There must be something systemic that we can control for that is leading to some of these outcomes, leading to some of these consequences. And I think that the Prophet wasallam confronted this issue by intentionally promoting people and putting people forward that might elicit some discomfort in their being positioned where he positioned them among the community. Because when we, and, 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 and I wanna say this, and I don't wanna put too sharp a point on this. To some degree, racial bias is almost inevitable. I myself uh, have recognized within myself certain instances or examples of racial bias or cultural bias or ethnic bias. To some degree, it's inevitable. So like, I live in Chicago. And in Chicago, the Hispanic community is mostly a recently arrived immigrant community. And a lot of the uh, positions in labor, manual labor, um, some menial tasks, although every kind of work dignifies, you'll often find Hispanic brothers and sisters performing those tasks. And I remember going to Denver for the first time, and my uh, wife, Allah Yurhamuha, was getting a six-week checkup, and the physician was Mexican. And I said, SubhanAllah, a Mexican physician? Wow. And she looked at me and she said, is that unusual to you? And I said, well, you know, being from Chicago, you just don't see a lot of Mexican physicians. But I never realized that maybe if 
that had been my situation for long enough, maybe I would have believed that maybe Mexicans were inherently incapable of becoming medical doctors. I never believed that. But it would be very easy for that lack of exposure to elide into a committed belief, to elide into a bias. Say, so, oh, yeah, right? That can happen almost naturally. It's like when I was in Egypt, most of the white or European people that Egyptians experienced were tourists. So these are people that are coming to the country with disposable income. Um, they're probably of the wealthiest and most educated of their societies, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the sub-Saharan Africans they saw entering Egypt were refugees. People coming, seeking a better life, often working in labor. And I realized that some of their perceptions of Africanity and Europeanness was just based on that very limited window of exposure that they had. Right? Some of that is almost inevitable. It tends to happen from time to time. One must recognize that this is just the limitation of my experience. This does not say anything about the inherent value or certain, you know, inborn characteristics that people possess. It doesn't say anything about that. But we have to hold ourselves accountable and we have to be willing to, to at least probe and to think about some of these ideas that we have imbibed we have imbibed, excuse me, and we have accepted as true, and they might just be extensions of a very, very limited experience, right? And I think that in our community, I find that people have very limited experiences with African Americans in real life, with black people in real life, but they're full of opinions about black people, right? That somehow being black is synonymous with being poor. How? Being black is synonymous with being uneducated. Being black is synonymous with being violent. And I'm always wondering from whence did you get these ideas? And why do you think that they're so definitive? Why do you believe them to be representative of anything besides just, it's just your experience, right? But to me, racism is the kind of mental scaffolding that wants to take those experiences and make an entire paradigm out of them. Oh, no, no, this is, you know, something happened to me in Egypt, and it was when I was, uh, you know, at the end of my time there. And I, I, I went into a barber shop, and uh, you know, I'm watching the barber trying to figure out whether or not I want to, you know, let him cut my hair. As you can see, the degree of difficulty for my haircut is not very high but I'm still quite particular about the way it's done. I'm usually watching how hygienic the barber's practice is. So I'm not watching how, you know, it's nothing to do here. But is he disinfecting the blades or the clippers? Is he changing the blades, et cetera? So I'm watching this guy and he was good. His practice was hygienic. So I knew that I wanted him to cut my hair. So I started pretending like I was from Saeed Masr, right? trying my best to affect like a, a Southern Egyptian dialect. Because if he knew I was American, I know the price was going up. I don't even think they think about it as a rich. They think about it as like a doriba. It's like a, it's like a tax. You got it like that so I can take it like that. Right? And after a while, he just said to me, Antimon Fane. I said, oh, he knows I'm not Egyptian. So I just said to him in completely classical Arabic, I said, Khammin. I said, you guess. 
I said, you guess where I'm from? He said, well, I know where you're from. I said, where? He said, Senegal. I said, La? I said, I'm from somewhere west of Senegal. He said, there's something west of Senegal? <laughs> right? I said, yeah, I'm, and I'm in America. I said, I'm from America. And he said, America Chica Pica. Right? Which was a reference to an Egyptian movie. I later learned. But then he got really serious. And he said to me, if you're from America, then there's something I have to ask you. And I got scared. I didn't know if he was going to ask like about the war in Iraq or something about Philistine or he said Obama. Muslim or walala? Is he Muslim or not? And I said, Obama, that's a Christian man. And he said, well, I can ism Hussein. His name is Hussein. There's no such thing as a Christian with the name Hussein. And I said, I believe that his father was born into a Muslim family in Kenya. But then even his father, after some time at university, he became a communist. He became an atheist. And when I said atheist, he said, Mulhid ish mulhid. What is what is an atheist? And I was shocked that he had never heard that term before. Atheist? What is an atheist? And I started explaining to him: these are people that don't believe in anything beyond the tabi'i. What are tabi'i? Nothing beyond the tabi'i. And he was like, "Are there really people like that? Like like?" But his concern was not salvific. His concern was social. He's like, what do they do when a baby is born? What holidays do they celebrate? How do they get married? He, like, he couldn't imagine life without today, without religiousness. He couldn't, he couldn't imagine that. And when I was explaining to him that, you know, atheism in Western Europe is quite popular. It's growing in America. Even the dual al Arabiya. He was, no, 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 no way, no way, no way, no way. And after a while, he paused and he said, Subhanallah, Rabbi Ahsan al Khaliqi. He said, My Lord is the best of creators. And I said, What caused you to say that? I mean, that was a strange pivot. I didn't expect that. And he said, If Allah can create and sustain people who don't even believe He exists, my Lord must be Aldeem. He must be magnificent. He must be overflowing in his grace and his mercy. This was like one of the biggest lessons I learned in Egypt. And it wasn't from any of my mashaykh. It was from a simple barber named Ahmed. I said he encountered something for which he had no analog. He encountered something that he had nothing in his frame of reference for this thing. And just with a simple Quranic view of the world, he was able to embrace a radically different other, and he had no need to like uh, 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 to to like make a tashwi, like to like like he didn't need to like dirty that thing, or uh, uh, even he didn't even feel like he needed to like go out and change it. And it didn't make him feel insecure in who he was or what he believed. And he could acknowledge the limitation of his experience and still say subhanAllah to atheism. Atheism. Some of us, we find people just of simple, we're talking about they simply have different ethnic backgrounds. And we can't even approach them with that kind of openness. SubhanAllah, that's different. I've never seen that before. No, there is some part of us that needs to categorize this as, no, this is ugly. This is violent. This is, uh, this is, and it's always strange to me that we don't see this as not just a limited exposure or experience that we have to something, but a definitive representation of what that thing is. And my question to our community why are we so insecure? 
There's no need for that. Do you really believe that there are people that have been denied dignity? Do you really believe that there are people that have been denied beauty? Denied makarim al akhlaq? This is, this, is, this is a strange way of thinking, right? And I think that racism, it emanates from that place. You know, it, it comes from that place. You know, it's almost like, um, subhanAllah, you know, it's a deep thing, man. It's a really, really deep thing. You'll find black American Muslims arguing that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was black. And one of my teachers who loves black people, he said, you should advise them to be very careful about these arguments. Loves black people. I said, why? He said, well, because prophethood is a Wahhabi phenomenon. God makes prophets. When they're arguing about the Prophet والسلام, being black, it's almost as if they're suggesting that blackness produces prophets. Right? They're arguing like blackness is so great that not only have we produced inventors and warriors and statesmen and women and, and scientists, we've also produced prophets. When blackness does not produce prophets, God makes prophets. Right? But then he said, and this is what is key, what kind of insecurity might they be feeling so that they feel this argument necessary. You should tell them that blackness has produced great inventors. Blackness has produced great statesmen and women. Blackness has produced great scientists. Blackness has produced great warriors. Blackness has produced people of the highest levels of genius and intelligence and brilliance and beauty. You don't have to do this in order to feel dick, it's already there. Truly the most ennobled of you in God's sight are those that possess the most taqwa. Because in all of those other respects, people have those things. God has been generous in his grant of those things to people. You know, like there's, you know, my teacher was essentially saying, there's no reason for that. Like you don't have to do that. You know, to feel as though there's some nux, there's some deficiency that by proving that the Prophet ﷺ was black, that deficiency is then covered. You don't have, there is no deficiency. There is no, there is nothing inadequate about blackness. There is no deficiency. And those of us that believe that there is some deficiency, the only thing I've been attempting to say is we have to ask ourselves, why and how did we arrive to such a conclusion? Where does that come from? And what basis does that conclusion serve? Why, what? It's untrue. It's false. So in conclusion, you know, this is really uncharted uh, territory because I, I think that I would like to see more writing about racism as a spiritual illness. There's much writing about racism as a historical phenomenon, as a social phenomenon, but as a spiritual illness. What is it? Where does it come from? And how do we cure it? Because, you know, people secure in what God has given them, there is no need to, uh, to deny what God has given anyone else. There's no need to do that. You don't need to do that, right? And I think that, um, you know, uh, the Muslim community in America really has no choice but to take aim at this issue of race. You know, there's no such thing as being racially agnostic in the United States of America. You can't say, you can't be colorblind. 
And even, I mean, this is what I was, like, this, see, this is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of there is no inadequacy. So it's like when somebody says, you know, I don't even see race. I just see, a, you know, a human being. Now, why would you need to say something like that? What, what? I don't even see, I just see, I just see a human being. And I'm thinking, so what, he's like a platonic essence now or something like that? It just, he doesn't have physical characteristics. He's like, what do you mean? No, it's because in your mind, blackness is synonymous with undesirable, right? Blameworthy characteristics. And you're saying, I can see past his being black and I can, I can see past her being black and I can see, you know, a dignified human being worthy of respect. But why is blackness something you need to look past? Why can't you just see an intelligent black woman? Why can't you just see an intelligent black man? Why can't you just see a morally upright black woman, a morally upright black man? Because something of these um, ideas about the inadequacy or unworthiness of blackness of black people, we've accepted them in some way. And if I myself, as a black man, can admit that I've accepted some of these things, then I think all of us have to be willing to admit that we've accepted some of these things. And we should try to purge, we should try to cleanse ourselves of these toxic ideas, right? I've accepted some of these things, man. You know, so, you know, I know that was a lot. Um, it's something that I'm clearly thinking aloud about and trying to find a way to contribute, to make an original contribution to the discourse of, uh, you know, around race in this country. You know, I'm, I'm totally dissatisfied with the discourse around race as it exists now. Um, and I think that, you know, Muslims have um, some, some original contributions to make there. Um, and we're just, you know, we're just thinking, thinking aloud about these things. So, قُلْ قُلْ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِرُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانَ And alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. If anybody has any questions, comments, ideas, rebuttals, Dr. Dr. Abdullah, Bismillah. No, Bismillah. Okay. Mm. I would imagine that a lot of people here. All right, for the beautiful talk, and um, I think that a lot of people here and probably online as well, um, sort of questions that they often would have about the topic of racism, is that? Because mm -hmm. many of us, if not most of us, I would imagine, would say, okay, we know what Islam teaches us about the issues of racism. Uh, but a, an important question always is, what can we do to fight against or dismantle racism, right, ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you haven't really, you know, spoken about like your definition of racism, what, what really constitutes racism. Often people think of racism as being sort of like a one way street and in particular directed towards blacks, you know, mm -hmm. and especially if it comes from whites. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So the question, I guess you would, I, I would say would be, and of course, I'm asking with my own sort of sort of ideas in mind, but um, how can Muslims contribute to um, ridding society of, I guess you would say, racial bias? Uh, and does that 
necessitate that we actually tear down any particular other races that are, you know, that we deem to be somewhat uh, undeserving of the type of compassion that we want to show to the less um, advantaged uh, or less privileged parties in society. Bismillah rahman rahim You know, I think that the first thing we have to do is just commit to a level of introspection that might make us uncomfortable. Um, I, I think questions of race almost inevitably, you know, make us uncomfortable. So that when we recognize that there is a kind of um, um, perception that we've been deeply impacted by, um, whether it's of, well, we're talking about race, so of blackness, for instance. Um, when that shows up in our personal experiences, are we willing to call it out? Because sometimes it's, very, it's unsettling that if, for instance, um, and, and, so, and, some, and sometimes, like, I, I, I'll just speak to my own experience, right? If um, somebody is presenting something to me, like, say, like, a, a real estate broker, right? We're, if it's one of my own people, I find that I'm listening much more closely, trying to, you know, trying to find some discrepancy in what was said earlier and what's being said now, right? But if the real estate broker and we're purchasing commercial real estate is white, I'm not listening as closely. Like when I recognize that I'm a black man in myself, I'm thinking, so do I really believe that my people are less square dealing? Like what, like, I, I can recognize that in myself. Like, you know, you know, and my wife might tell me after we finish meeting with the broker or meeting with, you know, a particular vendor, man, you grilled the black guy. You were asking him all kinds of questions, almost as if you didn't believe what he was saying. But it's like when the white guy presented, you just took everything he said prima facie at face value. And for me to, 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 to be willing to say, yeah, that, that, there's something wrong with that. If both of them are presenting and I can't point to any ostensible signs of dishonesty, but rather I'm just reacting to that some, something in me is wrong. And I'm a black man, but something in me has been impacted by maybe some images. And that, you know, we've talked about this before, that, you know, the creation of images, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I first embraced Islam, up until the present day, the hardest ahkam for me were the ahkam around taswir, around representational art. My family is a family. We've always esteemed art and artists. Art everywhere in our homes. So when Muslims were telling me, you know, you want to be careful with representational art, I was like, what, what, what could be wrong with representational art? And this is one of those rulings. I like plumbed the depth of that ruling. And what I arrived to was that when one begins to craft an image, this is something that really is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's musawwir. Because it's a tremendous responsibility to, to shape someone's perception of something. Now, in Islam, there's a, there's, a, there's a particular prescription around that when it's visual. But you can still shape images of people just in the stories you tell about them in the ways that you talk about them, right? So like, I know sisters can identify, sometimes brothers, and I don't mean to make this controversial or air dirty laundry, but brothers will use the term fitna as if it exclusively applies to women. So if you think about a young boy growing up and hearing fitna, fitna, woman, fitna, woman, fitna, woman, fitna, woman, now that when he marries, there's some deprogramming. There's some, some introspection that he has to, wait, hold on. This is, I've been, I've been affected by this. So I think to take a position vis-a-vis -vis racism 
we have to look at, okay, where have I been affected by this? And how am I going to rid myself of it? That's kind of answering the first, wherever it shows up, right? A willingness to ask why. And it doesn't mean, I mean, I'll put it to you this way. I often get Muslims that come into my office and they want to get married. Maybe the brother is African-American, the sister is Pakistani. And she's telling me, you know, this isn't going to go over well with my parents and this, that, and the third. And I can always understand why it probably isn't. I get that. You know, people that are deeply invested in cultural continuity, they want to see their children marry people that are like them, right? I mean, whenever I think about my daughters getting married, I think about them bringing home somebody like me. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, you know, she's like, you know, I like Brother Naveed. Well, I say, what about Brother Malik? He's a nice guy. I like him. We play basketball on Saturday mornings. He has good edge. I, I, I can understand that. But here's the difference. If it's based on like just a desire for cultural continuity, that's one thing. I get that. That's something we all experience as parents. However, if it's based on some unsubstantiated, toxic view that I have of Indianness or blackness, that has to be challenged. If it's like, well, he's black, he's probably going to beat you. He's black, he's probably not gainfully employed. He's black, he doesn't know anything about the religion. He's black, he, that, when those things, and I think I'm, I'm using that example because it's very easy to distinguish one to, 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 it, to, to, to misunderstand one to be the other. If somebody's just like, you know, I'm more comfortable with, you know, uh, culture that is familiar to me. I don't think we should criminalize that. I don't think that's a criminal thing. I mean, you probably couldn't tell, but I'm much more comfortable with culture that's familiar to me. But I don't have, I, I, I hope that I don't have any toxic, overgeneralized views about anybody. Because when you have those views, it degrades encounter. Meaning you're not even able to assess the person in front of you because you have all of these false, toxic, preconceived notions about what they're supposed to be, right? So whenever you see that, you have to catch yourself, hold yourself accountable first. And when we see it in our families, we see it in our institutions, we see it in our organizations, we have to be willing to hold them accountable as well. This is how I think we challenge this you know, in ourselves. In terms of racism being a one-way street, I, I, know, I know you, and I know your position, and I know that you take issue with a modern definition of racism that says that power is the sine qua non of racism. That if a person doesn't have power, they can't be a racist. I actually understand what that definition is trying to get at, right? That there's a difference. And I, I think that I'm willing to grant that. So I think that, yeah, uh, a person that is in a position to hire people or a person whose perception of blackness or black people might shape certain policies, might shape certain attitudes around policing, et cetera, is not the same as a person just sitting in his living room saying this about white folks and that about white folks. I don't think they're the same in terms of their impact, but in terms of the spiritual disease, it is the same. Right? It is the same limited understanding of God's creative power. And it's the same lack of appreciation for the diversity with which Allah Ta'ala has created. That is the same. And it similarly needs to be uh, uh, you know, cleansed. It similarly needs to be reformed, but the impact is not the same. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. That's good. So that needs to follow through. 
And, uh, you know, so, and I, and I agree with the distinction as well, right, you know, that be having a position of power, anything to, to do to someone that the other can't do is also, you know, is something true. You, no one can deny that. However, we also have to disabuse ourselves of this idea that only whites have power, right? Yeah, of you course. Know, and actually, that, and that's, that's what really what I want to get at is that, you know, so we, we, we are moving in this anti-racism movement you know, and with Muslims deciding we have to take a side on the issue, that fundamentally what we are doing are embracing the idea that only white people can be racist because only white people have power, yeah, not, both which are and that you know, And that, a that was, you know, to your point, Dr. Abdullah, that, that's why I wanted to start with myself. But, you know, all, I'm just a teacher. But what if I was a law enforcement officer? Right? What if I was, I mean, you know, I, the, uh, these images... Um, have been devastating to black people and white people alike in terms of the consequence of accepting a lot of these images. And, you know, some of them are just false. You know, a friend of mine was in California, but not in the Bay. Not in the Bay. And he was leading Salat al And he said that, oh, he was leading Salat al And he said that, uh, um, during the day, a black man who appeared, you know, by his clothing to be a vagrant, wandered into the masjid, asked for some food. They gave him some food. He started asking questions about Islam. They started answering his questions. After about two hours of talking, he decided he wanted to embrace Islam. So he embraced Islam right there. And they said he stayed all the way through Maghrib, Isha, and Tarawih, his first day as a Muslim. He's still at the masjid after Tarawih. He said, one of us lost a cell phone. We start looking around the masjid. Where's the cell phone? Where's the cell phone? Where's the cell phone? And he said that we were fighting with every ounce of our iman the sultan, the bad opinion that this man had taken the phone, right? But he, the, my friend said that some of the brothers were like, look, let's get real. He, he took the phone. You know, you know how it is. You know how they, you know how, come on, man. You know how, you know how, you know. And he said, just as they were, one of them was threatening to call the police on the man if he didn't produce the phone. Somebody looked and said, it's under the minbar. It's, the phone is under the minbar. And he said, man, it was the most awful feeling he had ever had in his life. And I said, when he told you that he didn't take the phone, why didn't you believe him? He told you he didn't take the phone. He said, I don't have it. What? I said, what prevented you from, from believing him? Was it that he appeared to be indigent or was it that he was black? And he said it probably was both, right? Now, this was a friend of mine telling the story. I appreciate his honesty, right? But in that moment, he could have called law enforcement. And I don't know what they would have done over a lost cell phone, right? But it might have made that man's life a little more difficult, right? So recognizing that, man, we have all been impacted Oh, by the way, the person was black. That's why, that's why I mentioned in the story, the person that was leading to the he was black. So this isn't about, we have all been impacted. Now I said, if the person coming in was, was white and appeared to be middle class, you would have said, my cell phone, I probably left it in the car. <laughs> that doggone phone, <laughs> he probably really stole it. No, I'm just kidding. You know, right? But... We have all been impacted very, very deeply, man. And you know, something that we were talking about earlier, and I, this Q&A is not just a conversation with me and Dr. Abdullah. Okay? I, I think that many of us don't realize the extent of the intentionality of this imaging. The images that you have, they're not by accident. It's not like, oh, you know, no, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a very 
um, intentional process by which, you know, these images have been created, man, on both sides of that, of that coin, right? So we have questions coming in online, but before we okay. get to that, I'd like to make sure the sisters and the brothers uh, here uh, can answer the questions. So I know there's questions on the brother's side. I'll hand the mic over to the sister's side. We'll uh, kind of go back and forth one to one. So if you want to just raise your hand, I'll come over to you. No sisters? Okay. You'll get ready for that, inshallah. We'll have a brother here. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa um, <clears throat> To your point regarding understanding how to possibly think of, origin, of an original idea, of better understanding, um, of better understanding and possibly having a sort of resolution regarding racism. I sometimes see racism being looked at as a more recent phenomenon. But do you see a correlation of, tr of tribalism and racism as a root cause, maybe pre-programmed mindset that has escalated due to allowing a sort of protection over someone's tribe or group or even self? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. You know, the, the racism is a rather recent phenomenon because race is a rather recent phenomenon, right? Um, uh, you know, other, particularly like in the ancient world and the, 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 you know, when we talk about the ancient world, what really matters to us is the context of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu jami'an. Racism wasn't that kind of issue for them because in terms of complexion, they existed kind of across the spectrum. You know, you can read uh, Ijnuni's al isaba fi Tamiz al-Sahaba and you will learn that many of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, were dark-skinned, were, 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 were يعني, uh, asmar, right? They were, they, were, they were dark. But ethnicity was an issue. You still had some issue between Arabs and the Hubush or Abyssinians. And often, being Abyssinian in that context also meant that you had a, a former condition of enslavement or someone in your family had a former condition of enslavement, right? Um, and that produced, you know, uh, a lot of tension. Um, there's a famous story of Bilal and Abu Dhar al Ghifari. And the reason why, and some people you know, talk about the authenticity of the story, but my tahqiq suggests that the story is authentic. Um, um, Abu Dhar, he was himself a swarthy person. He was a, a, a brown skinned, dark skinned person himself. But when he said to Bilal, Ya Ibn as Sauda, son of a black woman, many people say he was referring to his mother's condition of enslavement, right? And, the, and, 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 and that is something that would naturally produce tension. You know, I say most of the, the struggles that people have experienced, intramural struggles in society, it's always about us, them. Who is us and who is them? Right? How do we define us and how do we define them? And that always produces... Um, you know, it, it can produce some tension. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that racism is just a modern iteration of that, right? Um, and, 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 and race, race, I mean, race serves a distinct purpose. You know, blackness is an invention just like whiteness is an invention. It's not, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing uh, biological that takes somebody that has a you know dark skin that's Sri Lankan and somebody that has dark skin that's West African and says they're the same race. There's nothing, right? So, yeah, I mean, but race is socially very real. So, in a sense, like the context of race in America has made race which it's comb is race is racial now. You know, just the the the, the context has made race. Something very, very real, you know. But it's not, you know, um, self-serving, other obliterating ideologies and worldviews, not new at all. Not new at all. 
you know, not new at all. <laughs> and I, I think it's important to, I get in some trouble for this. You know, I get in some trouble for this. But I, I think it is important to humanize racism. Not, not, not to condone, but to say, look, this is something that without the guidance of the Quran and Sunnah, a human being could very easily fall into. Right? You know, just on the basis, like I said, just experience, like, yo, you know, just even like that something is, is munkar, I, 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 don't, I don't know what that is. It makes me feel like strange, or it's, it's, it's you know, it makes me feel uncomfortable because I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with it. And I think that the Prophet والسلام, there are direct references from his seerah where he saw things that were culturally unfamiliar, but he was not threatened by those things. Right? He, wasn't, he wasn't xenophobic. He wasn't, what is that? So like the famous story of Banu Arafida, who they were a, a tribe of newly converted Ethiopians. And they were in the masjid of the Prophet والسلام, on the day of Eid, right? They were doing like choreographed kind of exercises, right? But it's kind of like, it's choreographed. So they're doing it in unison. And they were saying, Muhammadun nafsun tayyiba. Muhammad is a pure soul. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ala alayhi wa sallam. sallam. And Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu was very uncomfortable with this. Some people say it was because they were doing this in the masjid. Some people say just that kind of celebration was culturally unfamiliar to them. And he started to throw husat, like little small pebbles. Some people translate like he was throwing sakrat, like he was throwing like boulders at them or something, you know, just trying to get their attention to say, stop, stop. And the Prophet ﷺ stopped Omar and he said, carry on. Sons of Arafidah. I want people to know that, you know, there is a space for levity in this great religion. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But I think that these are the things that really cut racism off at the root. And that's what I was attempting to kind of elucidate in my presentation is you don't have to be insecure about something that is foreign to you. So that now you have to categorize it as less worthy, ugly, bad, violent. Negative. Just say, subhanallah. That's why I was telling the story about the Egyptian barber. Just say, man, I'm not, I'm not, I've never seen that before. I've never seen people do that before. Subhanallah. Right? You know. But I mean, I, I, but, but also too, um, some of that, uh, I did, that deep identification with people, it takes time. It's not something that happens immediately. You know, I lived in Egypt for five years. Do you know how many times I got cheated in taxis and how many bean sandwiches I had? No. <laughs> but the day before I left, uh, no, the day before the Arab Spring, I was sitting in a taxi cab in Egypt. And uh, I said to the taxi driver, Husni, husni Mubarak da? I said, there's no such thing as a president that holds the reins of power for 30 years. He's a king. And the cab driver said to me, Husni, I'm Husni? He said, Husni Mubarak is a demigod. <laughs> you know, like, he's not a king, he's a demigod. And we started laughing, right? The next day, the Arab Spring happened. People in Tahrir, it was crazy. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Now, at the time, I was taking my final exams. Five years, and, you know, um, my first wife, she died in my third year. She's buried in Egypt now. Allah, may Allah have mercy on her. So getting to the end of this degree, this was hard, man. So I came into the house, I was so angry, I was frustrated, and I said, man, I've been in the sweltering desert, breathing in pollution for five years, and now you want Sakutan Nidam? 
let me finish my finals and then you can tear the whole thing up, man. Just let me, just let me get my degree, what I came for. And my roommate, he said to me, he said, obey the law. These are our brothers and sisters, man. And they have been suffering under tyranny for 30 years. They're raising their voices, articulating their demand for popular sovereignty. And all you can think about is your narrowly defined goal of being in Egypt. How petty of you. How selfish of you. And I said, hmm, you're right. I just hope they can wrap this up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I hope they can wrap this up in a couple of weeks. But what I realized in that moment was that distance, that is some of what it means to be an immigrant in a place. That even though I prayed with Egyptians, learned from Egyptians, I didn't really identify very closely with them. So that when this happened, it was just a nuisance to me. Man, what is this? Right? And I understand that some people come to this country with a similar mindset, with a similar frame of, you know, oh, what? black this, black, I, what, what is all of that? You know, I was at the masjid once, man. And uh, I have my own methodological issues with Black Lives Matter, but that's not the point of this story. After Juma, a brother came to the front of the masjid gave some announcements, and the last announcement he said, we're chartering a bus from this masjid? He was completely incredulous. To go downtown for a Black Lives Matter rally? And then he said, I don't know why this is important to us. We're white. My daughter looked at me and said, Dad, he's not white. <laughs> Right? But however he defines himself, he defines himself. Well, I don't know that badly. I don't. Right? But, but the point was, there is still a distance there that he doesn't even see. Like, how is this relevant to me? How does this, all this racial talk, how, what does this mean to me? Something has to, to click. When we begin to see, no, this is relevant to you. If you're going to be, it's impossible to be in America and this not be relevant to you. This is relevant to you. It's relevant to you because you wouldn't be here if it weren't for the civil rights movement. It's relevant to you because black American Muslims are one of the only historical Muslim communities in a Western industrialized nation that is not considered an immigrant community. It's, 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 it should be significant to you. But I realize sometimes it takes some time. It takes some time. So I think we have to be, um, uh, we, don't, we, we should not condone, but we have to be patient in allowing some of that transformation to take place. You know? Other questions? So sisters, uh, there's a sister Nimbra's right there and she's waiting for you. So just raise your hand and she'll bring the mic to you. I want to give you an opportunity. Questions on the brother's side and online. If there's anybody has a question, raise your hand. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, Jazakallah khair, Habibi. Appreciate everything. You, uh, you touched on something that's been. Uh, deep in my heart and, and, and actually troubling me for years and years and years. And that is uh, the marginalization of black contribution to Islam in this country. Um, and uh, just recently, I was praying Isha at the masjid and, uh, you know, the Muhammad after the Salah, you know, he's reading from Hifth al mm. And And uh, the uh, Imam, uh, who uh, the imam who uh, was an immigrant uh, he said you know he's talking about the importance of guarding your tongue and he said like you know if you get pulled over by a police officer you know he said sometimes we get angry that we got pulled over by the he said but just be polite and just be nice and you know and more times than not everything's gonna you know he said a lot of problems most of the problems that we have 
you know, because we're rude to the police. And this and that, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, yeah, you know, <laughs> right, yeah, you can imagine what my, so, Allah forgive me, my, my usual reaction to this is to get angry, mm -hmm. you know? So, the talk was about Hifta Lisan, so, an asmat. <laughs> I, I, I shut myself up, I didn't say anything, but, I, but uh, as, uh, you know, descendant of uh, people who worked um, in social activism in this country, my cousin who was a major contributor in the SNCC movement in the Bay Area, uh, the concept of being an ally is important. So I'm asking you, how can I, how can I help to in these situations? Because the reality is, the majority of these misogynists in the United States don't appreciate the fact that we're talking about almost 140 years of African American co contribution to the establishment of Islam in this country. You know, Islam wasn't established by any other ethnicity. When, when, when MSA was established in the 50s, I think when the first MSA started to be established in the 50s, you know, African Americans in this country had already been practicing and establishing Islam in various, mm -hmm. uh, uh, various forms for, you know, three generations. So. MashaAllah. You know, your, your, your comment reminds me of this article I read from uh, a young scholar uh, from the UK, and the article was probably very intentionally incendiary in its title. He said, there was never any black contribution to Islam. And I was like, of course, you're gonna read it after that. He said, because when you say a black contribution to Islam, you make it sound as if there is the central Islamic activity and black people are contributing to it. He said, their activity was the central activity. They, they didn't make a contribution. All of that scholarship, all of that civilization building, uh, like they were involved in the main formation. It wasn't like there's this main formation and black folks made a contribution. No, no, they were involved in that main formation. So his article, he said, don't talk about any black or African contribution to Islam. No, that, that was, they, they helped shape what Islam became as it emerged onto the world stage, right? I think similarly in uh, the United States, for a long time, you could say there was never a black contribution to Islam. What black people were doing in the name of Islam, right, to you know, in, in, in various capacities, that was Islam in America for all intents and purposes. Like, it, that's what Islam was in America. So it's no contribution. I think that, you know, um, you know non-black Muslim communities coming to America were put in a position that they really didn't ask to be put into, right? Um, you know, you have people coming to this country, many of whom are not coming for reasons of religion, right? They're really coming for reasons of upward mobility. They're really coming, you know, maybe to escape political repression. But, alhamdulillah, they begin to establish uh, religious institutions. And they just didn't seem interested, and this is my read of that history, they didn't seem interested in investing in what was already here. It's like, why, you know, I mean, didn't seem relevant to them, right? The add to that, that the black American Muslim community itself was going through a lot of changes and transformations in trying to kind of define its own identity and how it related to, you know, a more quote unquote orthodox, you know, version of Islam. And I think that Muslims from majority Muslim countries were just forced into the role of like authoritative arbiters. Because if they don't know what Islam is, who does? Right? So in many ways, I think, uh, look, 
look, you can't say this in Chicago, so I might not be able to get back into my home. I think that, 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 that loss of authority um, that, that occurred in black American Muslim communities, we contributed to that, man. We, we effectively disempowered ourselves. And part of that really was buying into the tradition without an emphasis on gaining mastery in the tradition. Like that's, you know, it's like, okay, look, Quran wa sunnah ulum, Quran and sunnah and religious sciences. But if I'm going to make this the center of my religious activity, I need to gain some competency in this. I can't make this the center of my religious activity and have to take it from other people because it'll be very difficult to be self-authenticating in a position like that. And I think only now do we have people that are confident and competent like Dr. Abdullah, like, uh, you know, um, Imam Zaid Shakir, like Dr. Sherman Jackson, people that can deploy the tradition but do so in very um, authentic but also personal ways. And I think that was lacking for a long time. So it was very easy to overlook, you know, uh, black American Muslim communities. But I, I, I do hope that, you know, that is changing. You know, I do hope that is changing. And then, I mean, the example you gave like about uh, policing, like community policing, that's a good example. You know, it's, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least the way, that we, um, the way that we first translate the ayah, says that he created us in nations and tribes, li ta'arafu, right? Li ta'arafu, basic, just to get, to get to know one another, right? This ta'aruf, one of the things you learn with the ta'aruf is you learn sensitivity, right? You learn sensitivity. You learn, okay, these are... Um, sensitive areas in these communities. From my time, you know, I, I spent my first two years studying Islam at a Darul Uloom Madrasa. So I learned certain things about daisies that, okay, you don't say that. That's a very sensitive, that's a very sensitive thing. You might not want to talk about that, right? I lived in Yemen, I lived in Egypt, I learned, okay, there's certain things you might not address in that way. And only after significant trust was gained could I say, why do people who I think are like religious people take this stimulant called cuts? Like, that seems like incongruous to me. Like, you, like, like, to, to like be so dependent on like a drug, it just, that's weird to me, man. But I wouldn't just come out and say that. Right? Because I'm, you know, I understand that trust must be built. Ta'aruf must be done before we can have those kind of, you know, uh, no holds barred conversations. And that's, to me, that's an extension of respect. But you find people, they will enter black communities, even though they aren't of the community, and just air opinions about, yeah, police this and police that, and, you know, education this and education that, and crime this and crime that. Family this and family that. And I'm just like, you're my sheikh and I love you, but you got to slow down. You, know, you got to slow down. Not, we haven't even approached the substantive merit of what you're saying. Because what you're saying may have some substantive merit. But you got to build some trust first. You, you know, you can't just, I can't just come into your house and, let me tell you about white people, man. This is the thing about white people. Wait, hold on now. Wait a second. We just, we just met you. Hold on now. Huh? So I, I think a lot of this, it would be interesting to me how those conversations look after trust is built. You know, how those conversations, you know, it's like, you know, a very, a very publicized thing, right? And I don't want to get into that. I really, I'm in the Bay. But if somebody says something about the deterioration of the black family, and we were having this conversation in my living room, and trust was there. I, I, I think this is something we should talk about. But if that trust isn't established and you just say, yeah, this is, 
This is not, that's not important. This is what's important. Well, oh, wait, wait a second now. It's not that what you're saying is substantively wrong. It's like, hold on, we, you know, wait, wait a minute, but just respect, respect. And I think that's a part of Ta'aruf. You know, that's a part of Ta'aruf. Yes. Uh, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I'm intrigued by the idea of uh, racism as a spiritual disease. And I'm wondering if you can say more about the value of understanding racism as a spiritual disease as distinct from, uh, you know, a character flaw, a social ill, a flaw of reasoning. Can you mm. say more about that, please? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, one of the um, greatest values of approaching something as emanating first from the heart is that it's applicable to everybody. And this is one of the ways that I think as a speaker or as someone calling a person to something, you, uh, you root your integrity. See, you find that because the goal is for the person to be receptive. And you find that some white Americans, they have this recalcitrant like, no, I'm not accepting that because they think that you're singularly charging them with something that is like unique to them. But when you say, wait, wait, this is a spiritual disease that any of us could fall victim to. I just think that uh, white Americans have a very vicious historical legacy of this spiritual disease. You see, I'm not saying that this is something that makes you subhuman or unhuman. I'm saying this has been a problem. And when we approach it from there, I have found a little more receptivity, a little more honesty in a conversation. Because sometimes, I mean, it's like, look, if you're conversing with somebody and your goal is to convince them to reform their conduct and you begin with, you are bio-deterministically inadequate in a way that you can never change. That might not be a conversation start. It might be like, it was nice meeting you too. But if you say, look, 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 these are kinds of spiritual insecurities that lead us to this need to denigrate other people on the basis of arbitrary things that really don't mean anything, and that these images that we have of blackness, or Hispanicness, or Arabness, or even whiteness, are things that we should challenge based on our encounter with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that to do so, we would feel better. Because you know, I mean, the thing about racism is that the one that, that, that is, is, is enthralled to racism is really the one that's suffering, man. Right? Not just the one that is, is, is experiencing racist abuse. The person enthralled to racism, it's like, what a disgusting way to live, man. Like, what, like why would you want, uh, uh, like, what, like, what protection or what security do you think you gain in living like that, in believing in such uh, an ugly way? What do you gain from that? You know, when the Prophet ﷺ addressed Abu Dhar in the story that we previously told, he said, إِنَّكَ رَجُلٌ فِيكَ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ You still have some of this like ignorance in you. And Abu Dhar, mashallah, he wanted Kamalul Iman, he wanted his faith to be complete. So he went back and atoned for what he did. But see, the, these were the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum jami'an. Just to know that, you know, Allah Ta'ala says, فَتَخُلُوا فِي السِّلْمِ كَافَ Enter into Islam completely. And with an attitude like that about this man's ethnicity, some part of you has yet to really embrace Islam. He said, no, 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 I, I want to embrace Islam. I want to get myself together, right? So when you talk about it as a spiritual illness, I feel like you, um, you leave the person room for redemption. And um, 
as a Muslim, I'm, I'm, I believe that no human being is beyond the pale of redemption. I believe that. I'm Muslim. So sometimes even when, you know, uh, and, I, and, I, and look, I understand the need for catharsis. You know, I, you know man, like, like, I get it, man. I get it. Like, when you have been bombarded your entire life with anti-black views, and some of us ashamedly, we know that, man, there was a time in my life where I thought I was less intelligent, less beautiful, less worthy. You feel not only guilt for having felt that, but rage at the people you think made you feel that. You're angry. You're really, really, you know, I, you know, personal story. I was always a distinguished student until I became an adult. <laughs> and I went to a school that was racially mixed. And there was a white guy. If he's a Muslim now, that would be crazy. But there was a white guy in my class named Gary Shelton. And Gary was also a distinguished student. And whenever we were issued exams, my goal was to finish before him and score higher than him. Like I, like, I felt like I had to do this for all black people. And I'm talking about if Gary submitted his test before me, I would tear my test in half. And my teacher would be like, what has gotten into you? I'd be like, man, Gary turned his paper in before me. And she's like, it's OK. It's, 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 it's OK. When I think about what I, this was in second grade. What was, what was the world around me saying to me such that I had pressure in second grade to outperform this, this, this uh, classmate? I gotta, gotta be Gary, gotta be Gary. It's not true what they say about black people. It is not true, it is not true. That is that when you think, when, it, when I think about that, it's enough to bring me to tears. Like I was a second grade, I was in, I was eight years old and I felt like pressure. I gotta do this for my people. As an eight-year-old boy, I understand, I guess what I'm saying is that I understand like that feeling of like uh, rage and why we gravitate toward the most scathing critiques of white supremacy and white people and it's something they can never get rid of and this is just who they are. I understand why we would gravitate toward that, but I just think the call of Islam is something higher than that. I really believe that. I think Islam is calling us to see these as these are spiritual illnesses and there are spiritual cures. These are spiritual illnesses and, the, and there are spiritual cures. So when Malcolm X, in that famous account in his autobiography, says that he was making Hajj and he saw people that were white, but it's like Islam had removed the whiteness from their mind. That was a very mubash, a very straightforward way of saying, man, I met people that they seemed cured of this thing. And an admission from Malcolm X that a cure is possible. And if a cure is possible, that means that this is a spiritual illness. This is not something that's like biodetermined. No, a cure is possible. Right? A cure is possible. We can actually aspire for greater harmony and an appreciation of each other. But I do understand it, man, there's a lot of pain there, man. There's a lot of pain there. There's a lot of pain there. Um, you know, there are uh, things that, you know, a lot of black folks scarcely talk about uh, in the presence of other people. Skin lightning and stuff, a pain that when you think back on that stuff, it's humiliating. It's like that. that Somebody incentivized me to hate myself. Damn, subhanAllah, what, how? And I'm a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like God created me this way and I, was, I would curse the darkness of my own skin. Man, there's pain there, man. But I think in, in, in um, um, you know, approaching it as a spiritual illness, I think you'll find people more receptive and you leave room for a spiritual cure. I think that's the main, you know, advantage. 
you know, as opposed to talking about it as just something historical or something, you know, sociological. And then the other part of it, it's true. You know, in the fajasadi mudra, in the body there's a lump of flesh. Everything is, is, everything emanates from the heart. Racism too. So the question really is like, man, what, what, is, what is in your heart that would, that would you know, uh, cause this? And there's some very interesting discussion about that. Some people say it's not insecurity, but rather greed. Some people say white supremacy is really just a, a sub-creation of avarice, of greed. Right? That we have to create some, you know, I was, um, I was um, doing the shameless plug Zaytuna podcast. Right? And I was talking with uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, Professor Muhammad Faldin and uh, Professor Lawrence Januzzi. And in the course of the conversation, they helped me to see that, you know, you had enslavement, you know, in the classical ages of Islam. But enslavement was something that was seen as a part of, like, the vicissitudes of life. Like, it wasn't something inherent to a person's being. It was like they fell into this position, just captured on the battlefield or, right? But in a republic where the government is supposed to be representative of its citizens, the only way you can explain enslavement is that, no, 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 this is inherent to their condition. There is something about them that makes them primed for enslavement, right? And anti-blackness is a created, that, that is like the genesis of anti-blackness, that no, 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 no. It's not like this just happens to be. That, oh, you know, this happened in in another situation, they could be the masses and we could be the slaves. It just happens to be that this is what the situation is. No, 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 no. Enslavement is uh, inherent to these people. So you have to create all kinds of theories to justify that mistreatment, right? That is legally enshrined and recognized. And anti-blackness comes from there. So some people say it's from insecurity. Some people say it's from greed. You see, we want to enslave them, but we have representative government. We have to explain that enslavement to ourselves. How, how can you do this if we're supposed to be a republic? Oh, then the racism comes in. You see, subhanAllah. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, uh, I think you're, it's nice that you're so um, yourself as you speak. And, and you're yeah, that can be a compliment or an insult. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> My husband's back. <laughs> but like your, your, um, the way your humor, your humor. No, no, is just like humor okay. stuff I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so no, I enjoy listening to you. And um, hearing what you have to say, I think that um, as you speak, it it like it brings certain emotions up because um, my husband is black, so I I know like how that can feel like that feeling of of um, overcoming like like the the indifferences um, built in society uh, and. Um, just so, like now, being an adult, you said it's different. So, um, in what way is it different now for you? Bismillah. I think it's different now because I recognize these things. Like, I still catch myself doing certain things, but I recognize. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Right? What, what, you know, it's kind of like, I'm grown. Alhamdulillah, I've had no run-ins with the law in a very long time. And I'll still go into a convenience store owned by someone non-black. And as I go into the aisle, I would make sure that I'm holding up what I'm planning to buy so that they can see clearly that no theft is taking place. Then I said, man, why am I doing that? Like, that's the difference in being, oh, like, man, I don't need to, if I feel like that, I shouldn't shop here. And if I would, you know, you know, patronize a store 
where the people feel that I'm a threat or a thief, what's wrong with me? So unless I absolutely have to, even like in Chicago, like the, 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 the auto owned store with the big bulletproof glass, you know, I'm like, if you're afraid of me, then don't take my money. <laughs> if you're afraid of me, then don't, don't take my money. And, and, and then, you know, I, I, I have people that say, but obey, man, it, I mean, armed robberies really do happen in this neighborhood. So what do you, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And it's complicated because, I mean, I have people that I think are like genuinely sincere proprietors and vendors that like, wallahi, wallahi, I don't have anything against black people, but I'm just trying to protect myself. And, and I said, well, you know, you do realize that this thick glass, right, it conveys a message it conveys a message to everyone that comes into that store in that neighborhood, right? Now, for the people that have some criminal intent, maybe it conveys the message, yeah, this is not the right place. Well, for people who don't, it conveys this idea that I'm dangerous. People are afraid of me. You know, even the people that take my money and serve me, they don't even want a modicum of human contact with me. And I think that that message is dangerous, quite frankly. And um, how we bridge right, your need to be secure with the kind of messages we want to promote in these communities, wallahi, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dilemma. But one brother's name is Abdullah Hishmi, Palestinian, runs a, a you know, fish and chicken restaurant in Chicago. We would have these conversations. And he just said, you know what? He just removed his bulletproof glass. He said, man, I don't want to convey to the people that come into my store that I don't respect them or that I'm afraid of them or that I want their money, but I don't want to get close to them. Five years hasn't been robbed or anything like that. Nothing has happened to him. In fact, the people respect him more. He's, he's been able to form better relationships with his customers. And he's complained of nothing except... Man, just trying to keep up with all the new hires because the money is rolling in better. So some people, and for them, it's spiritual. You know what? I recognize there's a threat, but this, is, this isn't conveying the right message, man. For me to be an outsider to the community, doing business behind a thick glass, making people stuff their money underneath the glass. And I told Kelsey, Allah, whatever happens to me happens. I don't care. Nothing has happened to him. Mashallah. Shout out to my man, Abdullah. Alhamdulillah. No. Can I add one more thing, sir? So earlier on, you had said um, about humanizing, or like, like what you said was about humanizing racism, and it, it's kind of interesting, like funny. I don't know, but so as a convert, um, already my family has to accept Islam. Then I marry an African, and then they have to kind of like um, see, like, okay, he's he's he's. African. You, you, I'm, the, I'm probably the first one to marry African in my family. So, and I was like, you know, I want them. I was, I was happy eventually. Like, I was happy to bring able to bring his culture. Like, our families came together and got to sit and and try different foods and those kind of things. And I was like, alhamdulillah, like, um, that that is a form of like of Allah helping to them to bring people together. So that's why I think I love, um, you know. Being able, that's one part of not looking, like especially with love, is when you're looking. Beyond, that's beautiful. You know, honestly, you want to know something crazy about that? My route to Islam came initially through like a heightened cultural awareness and identification with, you know, my blackness and my Africanity. That like, that's where it started for me like in like seventh grade, eighth grade, you know, reading kind of that, that black press that you only find at black bookstores, right? And that culminated in my embrace of Islam. But when I was really growing in my appreciation of, you know, um, my heritage, something that really crept up into me, I hated seeing 
interracial couples. Whenever I would see, I would be in downtown Chicago, and of course, I mean, any kind of interracial couple, it angered me. But if I saw a white man and a black woman, man, my, my month was thrown off. Oh, my God, man. Oh. And then one day, I was talking to two Muslims, married, white man, black woman. It's early in my Islam. And they seemed like people that had such integrity in their relationship. Like he was good to that woman and she was good to him. And it just, it hit me like lightning. I said, these are two people that Allah Ta'ala, his qudra, his taqdeer has brought them together. If I, because of something I have going on, have a problem with that, I'm sick. Something is wrong with me. I'm sick. Something is wrong with me. But I, I, I was able to have that moment, right? This was something that I, I carried even as a Muslim for a long time. Just, you know, I'll be seeing a sound like sister. You can always come home. You can always come home. Stop for love. Stop for love. Stop for love. What is this? And then one day it just hit me, man, like, look, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. These are two people that Allah Ta'ala has brought together. And they are together in matrimony upon the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you have a problem with it? Man, something is wrong with you, man. And I was able to sit with that for like a couple hours just sitting in the room like, you know what? Something is wrong with me. There's nothing that isn't beautiful about that. This is a man and a woman that love each other. They have children. They care for each other. They worship Allah together. They practice the sunnah of Muhammad wasalam, together. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? So even for me, you know, do I want my daughter to come home with a guy that's six fives? You know, an extremely intelligent African American Muslim, very handsome. Sure, I do. But if she came home with any Muslim, practiced his deen, worshipped his Lord, strove to emulate his Prophet, I got I got a problem with that. Uh, something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. And I, I'll say that publicly anywhere. I, got a pro I think that something's wrong with that. Something is wrong with me. Right? So I just hope that your family can, can get to that place through seeing the integrity that you all have in the relationship. Where it's kind of like, you know, this particular couple in Chicago, I just said, if two people were made for each other, it's definitely Ali and Mike. You know what I'm saying? If it's two people made for each other, it's them. It's just, that's, they're, they're made for each other. When people have integrity like that, you know, it, I think it, it has the power to melt away some of those biases. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Allah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. We just uh, three minutes. Was, if this lecture goes any longer, I got to call a realtor. <laughs> yeah, we're just three minutes away from uh, Isha, but I do want to give. I'll move it to the bay. <laughs> I want to give time to our online viewers. We have quite a few, and one question that came for Sheikh, uh, real quick here, is about um, defeating the implicit bias and using that to defeat the hate that's out there. And the questioner is asking specifically about tasawwuf or spiritual purification and using that to purify and cleanse the implicit biases we have embedded in us. You know, the, the, the thing about um, tasawwuf as a, as, a, as a discipline is it just encourages self-awareness. You know, the, the, the biggest difference I see in people committed to a path of um, spiritual discipline is that they don't take for granted that everything produced by the self is worthy. They're willing to, to sit with something produced by the self and and identify it as, that's from my own weakness, right? That's from my own spiritual malnutrition or underdeveloped, like that's, that's something for me. That has nothing to do with that other person. 
And I think that people that don't um, have that practice, uh, it's, it's much more common for them to take whatever is produced to their heart or their mind as somehow indicative of truth. Like they feel something, it must be true. Cause I mean, I, you know, uh, I saw a black man walking down the street and I decided to cross the street because, you know, you know, I felt it. That might have nothing to do with that man and everything to do with just you, right? right? In, in fact, you know, I find that um, when we are more reliant upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's less need for any of that in almost every facet of life. Like, you know, it's almost like when I think about implicit, you know, bias, even though some of it is, you know, inevitable, right? Um, when you're aware, self-aware, you're able to catch it much more, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, here's a, a good instance of implicit bias. Many black American professionals that speak in professional settings, they say that they can actually feel that people are listening to them waiting for a single solacism, a single grammatical mistake. So they can say, I don't know how he got through Berkeley, man. He can't, you know, you know, his subject doesn't always match his verb. Right? But somebody from the UK will come make all kinds of grammatical mistakes. And it's simply regarded as just a regional, a regional dialect, some local flavor. He in no way invalidates his intelligence. It's just, you know. But in the case of a black person, it's like, you know, and this, this can be a person that has a JD from Harvard. He says a sentence, the subject doesn't match the verb. Oh, there you see, I, affirmative action, man. <laughs> affirmative action, man. That's, you know. <laughs> but when you, but, but see, this is the, this is that, 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 you know, spiritual discipline piece. By trying, now let's just say it's the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person has, you know, um, you know, is a very accomplished person, is a person that, you know, has the work ethic and the drive and, the, you know, inherent ability to achieve what he is said to have achieved or to occupy the position he occupies. My question is, what do you gain through attempting to invalidate him? Will it make you feel, I don't know, like something has been denied to you that you should, I should be the one in that position? See, that's a spiritual thing. That's a, a lack of kana'a, a lack of contentment. Do you feel like, look at this, I, I'm working under this guy? That's Allah gave that person that. What, 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 what's behind your need to deny her or deny him? Well, why do you want to believe that they're undeserving of what they clearly have? What is that? And this is what I was saying about trying to get back to a, a, kind of a, a spiritual outlook. That what is that? Where does that? Where does that come from? So like implicit bias, I think, is a good place to like, where does that come from? What do you, like, what, what's, I guess my question is, what's in it for the nafs? A willingness to ask that. What am I getting out of that? If I say, yeah, this person uh, has some nefarious kind of, what am I getting out of that? To say, well, I'm better because I don't? Or what, what, am, I, what am I getting out of that? And I think the soul will help us with that a lot. MashaAllah. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. May Allah reward you, Sheikh. Uh, so really quickly, before we have uh, the adhan for Isha, I want to mention that uh, Sheikh Abdullah Evans, along with Dr. Hayford Yunus, Dr. Rani Awad, uh, Sheikh Rami Nasur, a lot of other local scholars, and uh, we'll be speaking tomorrow night at 5 o'clock at the Hilton in Newark, which is just by Fremont. Uh, you can go to mifta.org forward slash circle uh, for those who are watching online to 
to um, do that. And then for those that are here, you can get 30% off for your ticket tonight uh, by going to the sister and brother uh, there in the lobby, and you can get registered. They did co-sponsor tonight's events. Jazakallah khair. And we'll have the other one for Isha. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Thank you.